This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network and Modest Way Don are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy, sell, short, cover securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value if we are long and fall if we are short. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome back to Avoiding the Crowd podcast. I'm the show's producer, Robert Kraft. And joining us today is not only our host, Maj Swaydan, but we also have our first in a line of what we expect to be many uh, management interviews, uh, which we said we'd do a few times on this show. So with that, I'd like to throw it to our host, Maj Swaydan, to introduce our guest for today's show. Maj, it's all yours. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, thanks for being here, Andrew and Chris. Um, the, um, and uh, really, uh, I think this is going to be a great episode. Um, so, look, I, you know, as you said, Bobby, we talked about having uh, management interviews before, and I thought this would be a great way to kick it off with FTDL because it, it embodies a lot of what we do at Geo Investing. Um, Geo Investing is a site that I uh, run, and we cover smaller cap, minor cap, and nano cap companies. I've been following FTDL first time designs for some uh, some time now, but I really didn't. Um, you know, really take part in buying a stock that, um, um, that much in the past. And I really got more excited about the story and we're going to talk about why that is. But when you, um, when you go through the story and the journey of FTDL has been going through here to get to where they're at today, you'll notice it, it's, it embodies a lot of what we do at Geo Investing. We look for turnaround stories of these, what we call tier one companies in, in the nano cap space. These are companies that have been around for a long time. Um, and just waiting for some type of inflection point to arise uh, and arrive. And I think um, that that may be the time for the first time. And I, I do own some stocks. So I need to disclose that. Um, and what you, you have here, an interesting story where Andrew Bass is an investor and then joined the board. Uh, Chris Baring is a CEO of the company, um, used to be with uh, just at part of the company. So we're going to learn about their journeys um, of coming, coming together at first time learn some of the core values of the company, which I think are really um, important core values to have, especially in turnarounds. And I've come across these type of core values before in successful type of investments. So I thought it'd be a great way to kick this off. It's an easy story to understand, which is another p uh, piece of the puzzle I like here too. I like simple stories. And so with that, let's kick it off. Um, and um, let's talk, um, you, know, I'm gonna, you know, Andrew, I'm gonna talk to Chris first, then we're gonna come back and talk to Andrew a little bit later. Uh, but of course, Andrew, you can chime in anytime you want. Uh, if you if you feel like um, getting part of the conversation, this is really really casual here. Um, so, Chris, you know, well, I want to talk about your journey first, and how I like to when I interview management teams, I like to start talking about even before you may have arrived at the company and your CEO role. So maybe talk about a little of your history before FTDL and um, how you found the company, and um, you know why you um, are still here today. So. Yeah. Then, we'll, then we'll move into your post FTDL type of journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's kind of hard to start before FTDL, frankly. I mean, it's been about twenty years with 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 first time, so that 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 is just about the start of the journey. <laughs> uh, um, you know, going back twenty years, uh, I was hired on <clears throat> early as the uh, creative director. Uh, you know, we had one product category; it was basically clocks. And I really saw an interesting opportunity to create more value in, in, in a pretty simple product. And I think that that's actually, the, the, those skill sets have carried us all the way through to where we're at today, because it's how do you create energy and uh, create sales around a pretty simple product, right? So I, it, it's just all that they imported, it's all they had. They had one manufacturer and, you know, I was kind of brought in to, to, to add flair within that current category. Uh, and from there, we built a business all around brick and mortar. So Bed Bath and Beyonds and the Coles and, 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 and those kind of uh, retailers at the time, they were the bread and butter, you know, growth, growth was, you know, they're building everywhere. They were uh, expanding all over the place. And we were really 
unfortunately, management saw that as the growth opportunity and not, and not much else. Uh, and so, you know, we played in the sandbox as, as best we could. Um, you know, I, I was uh, put in a framework around management. Uh, so I worked closely with the, uh, my predecessor, the previous president, and really <clears throat> took part in every aspect of the organization. Even early on, 20 years ago, uh, I was managing the offshore relationships. I was hosting uh, uh, international uh, guests at my home, having, having dinner with the kids. And just a lot of fun growing and understanding the business. You know, it kind of takes us to where we're at today, uh, or, or rather 10 years ago, where uh, you know, I'll, I'll call it an audit. Shareholders and, and, and the board had done a, a preliminary audit, I'll say, on management and the structure and the hierarchy. And they weren't real happy with management at that time. And they were looking for, you know, it was on the brink of bankruptcy. I mean, the company was going under. It was uh, devalued. The stock is trading at below $2. And they were looking for something, a Hail Mary. Uh, you know, not, it's not every day that, that the creative director of an organization gets, gets even looked at for a potential, you know, possibility of, of managing an entire organization. So yeah, it was at that time they peeled back the layers and they thought, wow, here's somebody who is ambitious, understands the business intuitively, uh, and we have a possibility here. And so that's kind of where that, you know, I won't get too far ahead of the story, but that's kind of where that 10 and 10 is about 10 years of uh, operating within the business. In the last 10 years has been operating the business itself as the, the CEO. Now, if I understand this, when you were at one time, I think when I actually first looked at the stock, was, I think you had a different name. Was it Middleton Doll Company or something like that? So, yeah, it, it has changed over the years. Um, it was Lee Middleton. I mean, this is funny. It was the parent company of first time, really, you know, the company that operates today. And I recall sitting in my first shareholder meeting, you know, as a young guy, just interested, just wanted to, wanted to hear all about the company I worked for. Right. And uh, unfortunately we weren't even mentioned. <laughs> it had to, it had everything to do with these dolls, these collector dolls. And that's what the, the presentation was about. And that's what they talked about. I mean, it was a little disheartening. <laughs> I was like, Hey, but there's this little company buried within this $30 million company that's called first time. So, so you had so you had the doll company and uh, the dolls were being sold through the same outlets that the clocks were being sold different outlets. No, it was a totally different company based out of uh, Ohio, and they just did these high end collector dolls that sold for hundreds of dollars a piece. Very, very successful back in the day. Uh, it just as technology took over the world of um, dolls and kids, and it just really kind of plummeted uh, and. Ten years ago, uh, when I took over, it, uh, it we were basically absolving all of the assets at that time. It was really kind of had ridden its course. It was done. Uh, we sold off uh, some assets to Madame Alexander, uh, I believe, and uh, yeah, that was kind of like a, a new slate, very symbolic, uh, very kind of like let's let's start clean, new management, new restructuring, uh, revitalized capitalization. And, uh, you know, leading to Andrew's uh, introduction to the board, just a very exciting time for us. And uh, obviously that's kicked off a decade of uh, just stellar relationship with, with not only, you know, Andrew's uh, helped me understand not only the management uh, of an organization, but how to deliver the message to the shareholders who obviously s m most important. And so he's done a really good job at helping uh, direct those communications, transparency and all that stuff. All right, so great. So now, so when the company started, was it actually a doll company first, and then the clocks came along later? Yep. And then yeah. I believe you also had a, a financial segment also, correct? It did, yeah. There was a little bit of everything, some real estate, <laughs> finance. Yeah, you, know, you, you get this little business, and it's it's all wrapped up into one. But yeah, so it's, it's a convoluted story that really, basically the doll, the doll was considered the parent company. And within there, uh, there were some bankers involved, some professional athletes involved. And so you can imagine how a little bit everywhere zigzagging. So, and out of all that, there was this little tiny company that nobody even talked about called first time. I, I love, I love that. And then, um, so now, so you sold the, you sold the doll business, then you, you sold off the, I guess the financial, um, business, right? Yep. So you're left with this uh, clock business. Right. So from that point in now, so what's the goal there? Yeah, you have the clock business. Now, what do you do? I mean, you obviously, you need to expand your product line. You need maybe new, new outlets to sell your products. So why don't you talk about now 
since that point in time, the evolution of the company throughout the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is really indicative of the very, the, the very start of my tenure uh, as CEO. It really was the beginning uh, to really take a company that I'd worked inside of and now managed and restructure it from the top, top down, right? So I knew all the ins and the outs. Uh, and now being the decision maker at the top, it was very easy for me to uh, to operating, to turning around, to understanding where where we were lacking, where we weren't lacking. Product diversification, of course. Um, one of the first initiatives, uh, you know, we have one manufacturer. I mean, where today's society is at competitive, right? You're like, yeah, you guys just get everything, you know, right. charge whatever you'd like, and we'll just accept that. So one of the big initiatives early on was uh, manufacturing diversification on top of product diversification. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one. Uh, it, and by the way, the, the, the clock company, I mean, was doing, you know, 4 million in sales. I mean, that's, that's, that's no small feat when you're dealing, you know, you might as well be selling pencils. There's not a whole, you know, it's not real exciting. So it took, it took a lot of hard work. It took a lot of creativity to not only expand within that core business, which still, by the way, clocks uh, probably make up 50% of today's revenue, which I think is fascinating. Meaning we, we, all, we, we, we have a big part of clocks, which is surprising, but I always <laughs> saw, you know, you say clocks. Well, I call it functional decor. So even at a time where, you know, 2008, 2009, people saw value in that product. Why? Because it was, we were really designing home decor. And that home decor added as a second, second function, which was keeping time. So they saw their dollar going just a little further, it, the consumers did. And so I found it to be a fascinating product. And it really is the foundation of what we built the company upon. Today, obviously, we're in, you know, lamps and mirrors and headboards. Uh, we're in mattresses, you know, Casper mattresses that, that, that kind of roll up into a box. Uh, we're in that business just a little bit, again, very unique, very niche, the truck market, <laughs> high turnover rate in trucking. You know, there's, we, we don't oftentimes talk about mobile interspace, but it's a very niche business. You know, we'll sell 50,000 mattresses to the likes of Schneider, uh, you know, Navistar, Volvo. Um, now that's interesting. That, that, so this is an interspace, right? And you, this was, um, you entered that, I guess, over the road, is it called? Yeah, um, over uh, over the road trucking, OTR, okay, which is pretty cool. And so you have now you so you have this division that's selling not only the trucks but the R, the RV. RV, so, correct, right. correct. And it was a very, I mean, that was a fascinating exercise in and of itself. So so when we acquired mobile interspace within interspace, I mean, it was a it was it was terribly ran. The product looked hor horrendous. You know, there was no. Uh, it was just a perfect fit into our core competency, which is creating, you know, optimal value really in, in many different industries. Anything that I think we can get our head wrapped around, we'll pursue it. You know, I mean, we didn't know anything about trucks. I've never even been inside of a, a semi yet. We were able to flip this market upside down and it was a sleepy little market, pun intended. And today, you know, it's a thriving valuable uh, part of our, our, our portfolio. And I think it leads into, you know, where we kind of see things going in the next decade, which is we're very opportunistic and I'll, I'll stop talking and give Andrew the floor here shortly, but the combination of our two skill sets is invaluable. I found it to be, uh, I set out a lot of CEO roundtables. I talked, obviously I'm running in circles of managers. You guys are running circles with investors. And I think when you find this married relationship of operator and investor, and, and we go both ways, right? We, 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 we do each other's jobs throughout the day, many days. And so I think it's just a fascinating relationship. And having sat on, the, on many CEO roundtables, I just don't see that, that combination very often. You're, you're right. And I, I, I actually, another company I own, which I won't talk about it today, but I, that's just another reason I bought that company too. Um, and when I find that I like that a lot, um, just you have the investor who understands capital structure, understands you know, how to deal with investors. Um, and that's important for us. A lot of CEOs understand that. And, you know, you have this obviously um, uh, your own talents, which kind of, you know, turn around, especially, which kind of meshes together a little bit, yep. especially for a value investor, which I think Andrew is, we're going to learn later. So mm -hmm. it was a great, I mean, Andrew hunts for these kind of stocks. So yeah, um, yeah. it's pretty yeah. cool. 
It, it really is. Yeah, I, I, again, I've sat with a lot of, lot, lot of CEOs, a lot of big companies, and I just don't see that relationship. And, you know, it's been great because it's made my life a lot easier to have sort of an insider help me understand what it is they're looking for. You know, we, we're all getting the same information. I, I think delivery is really important, how that message is delivered. Uh, and, and we're aligned. I think that's really unique too, right? A lot of managers aren't invested in the company. They're just, they're just taking right. their paycheck and they're moving on, you know, to, to, to the next thing after their little three, five-year tenure. It's really not the case here. I mean, investors and managers are aligned singly. Excellent. And you have, so now you have, you've come from a, like a, basically since a one product company to, I think, over 20 products. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I'm going to say inter, inner space wasn't, wasn't just over there. They had, they had their own product line that kind of was kind of mirrored yours a little bit, right? Is that, that you Correct. Can... Yeah. Uh, uh, inner space was a unique acquisition in that it, it, it had a little bit of everything. It had some product diversification that we liked. Uh, they had distribution uh, uh, that we liked in Georgia. Uh, they had prop, they had product that we liked. Uh, it was a very simple, pr- pretty simple business. There, w- it, there wasn't, there wasn't any design. There was all these areas of improvement around our competency. What, 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 what I believe we could, we could do. And it fit really well, meaning they didn't have a design team. They were just really buying products off over, overseas, uh, aside from the mattress part, but really there's buying product, uh, miss, you know, rel- relatively needed uh, some restructuring, some, some turnaround, obviously. In conjunction with, they had um, different manufacturers. I saw value in that to where, you know, it takes time to, to go out, seek, find, uh, vet, run your due diligence on manufacturers overseas. I mean, it's not, you're dealing with millions of millions of dollars of product at any given time. And that's no easy feat. And so I saw value in embracing those manufacturing relationships or, or a few of them, the, the, the ones I've, I've thought would be most valuable. Uh, sourcing agents uh, that they use. I thought uh, there, there was a lot of value in that because we're a one man show kind of, you know, like I'm the one doing that. Like if I have to go do that, then I'm not thinking about creating value somewhere else. So from my perspective, sort of being the one to have to go do that, I found a lot of value in that. In conjunction with, they were online. They were 100%, again, mattresses aside, uh, online. And, you know, five years ago, I made that decision to move into the e-commerce space, which proved to be a very, very, very good decision. And, 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 and at, at a very, very good time, because had we not done that uh, in conjunction with outsourcing our distribution, which, which was really, really a, a smart idea, because again, they were considered essential through the COVID situation. If, if I was running my own warehouse, I was not going to be essential. I was not, you know, they're, they're in trucking distribution. They fell into the, the sweet spot. We wouldn't have, you know, if, if we wouldn't have gotten into uh, e-com, you know, brick and mortar shut down, distribution shut down. None of that affected us because we had outsourced all of it. Excellent. So you basically, you, you, you diversified your products, inner, inner space helped with that, got you actually quicker to your online kind of um, goals of doing that. You're in more countries now than you were in presence, at least, not, and you improved your ability to source material, I guess, and be more flexible. Yep. I, I guess at some point you've, you're positioning yourself to expand globally when you turn that switch on at some point because you have these relationships. Yes. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. So from that, so we basically, you've basically addressed the product side, kind of enhance that you made, uh, your, your more scalable business. What about the cost? Did you do anything on the cost side, um, gross margin, operating margins to improve that part of your business? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's it's really one of uh, the areas where previous management really uh, took their eye off the ball. Uh, it's a slim marge business. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a commodity. We're, we're you know we're not we're not a tech a tech company. We're not Coca Cola. Unfortunately, we're fighting for every penny in that marketplace. So, yeah, you know, looking back, I hate to say it, but it's very simple, right? You look at your products. You start to assess your gross margins. You start to assess your costs. Um, I, I mean, I don't think that there's many companies in the market and you know better than I, but you know, we've, we've got 12 employees and, you know, we'll do, you know, I don't want to get into the year in numbers cause they haven't been, been, been put out yet, but you know, like per, per employee, we're doing exceptionally well. And I think it starts again. I, I kind of joke that when I took over, we were broke. 
<laughs> it's like, it's like starting it, like, like put yourself personally into a situation where you're like, I'm broke and I need to figure out how to, how to get, how to survive. And that's really what happened. I went from the top down, you know, I was putting locks on the thermostat so they couldn't go above 71 in the, in the office. I mean, it got that, that granular. And so, uh, obviously, uh, diversification of manufacturing, huge, right? All of a sudden you got competition. That's weird. <laughs> Everybody wants to like sharpening their pencil a little bit. And I let it be known. I shared information on accident between manufacturers. Oh gosh, you sent that invoice over there. Oh, I'm so sorry. You guys got that one. You shouldn't have saw that. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing how that works. Next thing you know, our prices are getting strong, our gross margins. I mean, Andrew, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I mean, I don't think they've ever been better. No, and, the, and they're, they're continuing to improve. And, you know, we hope that trajectory will continue into the future because Chris is working very hard to make sure that that's the case. Excellent. Now, in terms of culture, guys, so one thing I liked – um, you know, and I think you brought it up, Andrew, uh, in our first talk was that Chris really has put together a, a employee culture that the, where the goals are aligned. It's about design. Um, it's there's really this kind of an invigorated type of feeling in there. Now that's really important in what you do. I mean, you want to have good quality product and, uh, um, and that consumers are going to like, and it can help you rank high. Um, so maybe you guys can talk about that. And was that not there before now it's here um, guys, or is this, yeah, I mean, when I, when I, when I, you know, again, ha having been on the other side of the wall, I'll say with, with the culture and the business and, 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 and what was there, no, there was no culture. I mean, it was very mismanaged. It was unorganized. There was no strategic initiatives uh, put into place. There was no long-term goals. Uh, it was really just kind of come in, collect a check and, and move on. And uh, that, that's what I inherited. Uh, today, the culture, you know, it's a, it's a low cost culture. I mean, it's low cost, high, high output, uh, really a, a great fun place. I mean, there's a reason why Andrew came, came, you know, came from the investment world and wanted to come work for me. I think you could tell we were having a lot of fun. We were doing a lot of exciting things. Uh, every day is a little different. Uh, you know, I move very, very quickly and it's really fun to be able to do that, you know, not, not every organization can be as fluid, uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, pivoting as we are at times, you know, and I, I, I really like that. And I think that, uh, uh, while I say we move quick, it's very methodical, often outsiders think it's quick, but it really took a lot of time to get there. Uh, and so when you get that, you know, there's employees that have been with me for 20 years since, since the very beginning. Uh, to include my creative director. Uh, she, she's amazing. Uh, she, you know, understands me. She understands the directives and can really capitalize on things very, very quickly. And again, once you get it, Andrew got it. Andrew got it kind of working with me at the board level. And I think he found a lot of value and, and excitement in that, which is why, you know, uh, I embrace his, uh, his uh, partnership at both levels, both, you know, as chairman of the board, uh, he is a, a director uh, I think it's just it's worked out really, really well. Awesome, awesome. Uh, now, um, so now you've, 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 we're going to move on to Andrew in, in two seconds here, but real quick. So you, you've grown revenues from about, maybe it was around seven, eight, six, seven, eight million when you took over. Is that right? It was less. It was less was million. Four, four and a half million. Four and a half million. Yeah. And I, mean, now I, you're, I, I would call the stock trading at even a dollar, a dollar and a quarter. <laughs> it's at 15 today you know not a bit not a bit, not a bit. and your revenues your, tra your trail revenue is about 18 million now i think that's right and you you had a pretty what were your you have your numbers in front of you for your 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 last quarter here you got them in front of you we have yeah. you know we haven't put out q4 yet but we're yeah. we've got the q3 numbers out yeah I mean, I mean q3 i didn't mean q4 i'm oh, sorry yeah, q3, yeah. Yeah. q3 and q2 actually i think q2 was a turning point for you guys but yeah the q3 mm-hmm so I think what you had sales of what uh, six point three million versus three point four million, and you can't earn per share of sixty seven cents versus eleven. That's a I mean, that's a huge, a huge move, and everyone's gonna add, and, and I think you had some you had good growth in the Q two also, um, and you improved on that. There is some seasonality in your business, um, and you're gonna have investors tell, hey, you wait a COVID nineteen here, um, how long is this gonna last? And you had a little push in online, uh, maybe you can, but you were already having success before. 
COVID-19, I guess. And maybe talk about that, that negative type of maybe view, or I don't have negative, but less positive view. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. I mean, I, I, I think it's a couple things, right? I, 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 do, I do not want to give COVID 100% of uh, the credit here because really things were positioned. Uh, I, it, our strategy just coincided with, with where COVID had hit. It's, it's very ironic how it hit at the exact same time we were implementing, already implementing a strategy that hasn't changed. It's the same strategy pre-COVID as it will be post-COVID. And we expected this. We expected growth. Now, do I believe that there are more people shopping online? Of course, you can't argue that. Of course, COVID played a role into the accelerated growth. But I do believe in the strategy that, that we enacted, you know, up to five years ago was taking us to this place. So whether it's 50% of what we did this year, you know, the numbers are, are staggering, right? I mean, it's, it's, they're staggering. So maybe they would just be really, really good without COVID, but we were moving, we were moving in that direction. And I, I, yeah. I think there's two, if you don't mind me throwing mm -hmm. out there, there's, there's a couple things that you got to remember. First is the migration from brick and mortar to online. That was happening with or without COVID. But again, to Chris's point, this might've just accelerated that market share shift a little bit. And e even if it resettles, it's not going to be what it was a year ago. And I don't think it'll ever return to what it was a year ago. And the other dynamic, Maj, that we talked about a little when we spoke is how when you're selling into brick and mortar, you know, it's very hard to, to increase your SKU count in brick and mortar given the, the scarcity of shelf space. So we own the clock market for many years, but it was very hard to extend that, that into other product lines where on the online space, you know, we now are, you know, dare I say, dominating in bar carts online, kitchen carts, mirrors, end tables. And we're seeing the consumer get in front of our products, which couldn't have happened in the brick and mortar space. And so I think that in combination, which I'm sure Chris will talk about a little bit more and how we're rolling out products, is a, is a significant driver of our growth that has nothing to do with COVID. Mm -hmm. Great points, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, it just basically just accelerated kind of the online experience, you know, maybe a couple of years anyway, it was happening anyway. And it was great that you're, you're in position. Some companies weren't in position like you're, you're, and you're, you're going to take advantage of that too. Absolutely. And Chris, Chris did an unbelievable job, of not only setting a low cost culture, but also setting a culture that, is geared toward more variable costing. And so when we scale, and originally I think Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but we talked about it on the downside to say, well, if you lose shelf space on the brick and mortar side, we'll be able to flex our distribution, which again, after employees exp employee expense is the second largest expense in a business for, for companies like ours. Mm -hmm. It's so just so happened now it's working to our favor on the upside because it's so much easier for us to flex our space and continue to take market share in these product categories online because not only do we have the inventory, but we have the space to actually store the inventory, which a lot of companies, if you're in five or 10 year leases, really are struggling to do right now. That's a great point, man. And something else I also like, guys, you, I remember, so the, um, what I love, what you took in a road and you made it a better company. But I also like that you, you also kind of introduced that RV product category to inner space, right? It wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. And that, that was opportune. I and mean, you didn't know that, you know, COVID-19 has kind of put this RV stuff on the map and right. um, or um, accelerated the growth there. And that's really awesome. And not only that, as younger people are driving trucks, younger people are buying RVs and they're going to have a, an interesting probably, um, you know, feeling about what they want to be comfortable. They, they're probably going to want to be more focused on the furniture in their RVs, in their trucks, right? Yep. And yeah, that, it's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. it's fascinating. That actually also extends to, in my opinion, to home goods. If you polled the younger generations, and remember, Chris, would you say the retails on most of our products are kind of between $25 and $250? Mm -hmm. If you polled the younger generations and how often they're moving from apartment to apartment or condo to condo, that number is going up pretty significantly. Right. And so one of, the, one of the big drivers that Chris is 
excellent job on over the last you know five or ten years has been to position the company to take advantage of these demographic shifts where you know it's it's not going to break your bank to go and buy a fifty dollar wall mirror because you just moved into a new apartment and then you get married and you move into a condo and it breaks or you don't want to take it with you you know you're moving on to your new home and it's okay you can spend another fifty dollars on a new mirror great so um now, I, Chris, I'm going to end this with now. I'm going to move over to Andrew real quick. But do you invest in stocks at all, Chris? I mean, are you? Um, have, do you have a portfolio? Or oh yeah, is, 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 yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm that, what that looks yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I, I, I definitely am familiar in that environment. I'm, I definitely trade. Um, obviously, my trades when when I can have become a lot easier because I just buy more FTDL stock. <laughs> <laughs> No need, no need to do any analysis. Maybe not too diverse. diversified. Now we're talking. I love to turn a dollar into 15, so I just kind of <laughs> yeah, I'll just go over here. I kind of, yeah, uh, let me make a shift. Great, great. So do, you have, do you invest in big caps at all or ETS, mutual fund? Well, mean, right, right, right. Yeah, you know, obviously, I, I uh, not not really. I kind of like the small space. I, nice. I, I like the things. I think there's a lot of value in those small uh, uh, market cap companies, and uh, you know, I think it's it, it's actually intrigued my interest uh, as as an operator, as a CEO, as a as a turnaround guy. To you know, listen, I never take my eye off of uh, future opportunities, and you just don't know how this company is gonna shake out in the long run. I mean, there's opportunities as Andrew and I have identified in other small cap companies that are potentially maybe being mismanaged, uh, misdirected, and so uh, playing in that space, understanding that space, meeting with management teams, even in my own portfolio. Uh, says to me that there could be uh, opportunities sitting out there just kind of waiting for someone like like this duo, uh, Andrew and I, to, to maybe come in and add some value uh, creatively and opportunistically. Great, great. Awesome, man. That's a, I'm, I'm glad to, that me, you being an investor and feeling our pain so you can understand <laughs> what we go through. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. We're madness when we complain sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm so friendly. I'm so shareholder friendly. I'm, so friendly. I'm like, hey, I'm one of you. <laughs> so let's let's uh let's, let's go. Let's um give uh let's go to Andrew now. Let's talk a little bit, Andrew. You did a great job, Chris. Thank you for bringing that um um really uh nice summary. Absolutely. Yeah. And your write-up was great. And uh, again, thank you for, for having us. I think it's, uh, it's, it's great to, to uh, uh, sit with you guys, get your thoughts, get your opinions, because again, you, you know, uh, as they say, it's cliche, but you're the people, <laughs> you know, you're the shareholders and uh, you know, we, uh, we are, we are very, very shareholder friendly. Our pleasure. And by the way, yeah, everyone listening out there, we did write an article on this company on geoinvesting.com. So great. if you don't want to ask that, you can check out our premium services it's uh, four hundred dollars a year uh, for and uh, two ninety nine for six months membership, and you'll be able to read that whole article and continue to interact uh, with our team about FD. So, um, Andrew, so let's 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 talk about you now. Well, you've been sitting there nice and patiently and waiting and quiet. <laughs> I know you. I know you just want to get out here and talk stocks. <laughs> so, yeah, I have work to do. <laughs> this is like the intermission between like operations and you know finance. Right? <laughs> So, you know, I really enjoyed talking to you and, you know, as, as another, you know, nano cap investor, and I know you played yeah. in that space. So let's talk about your journey before FTDL and then post, let's just, just kind of the same format. And then we're going to talk about your investing process and how it would mean if I had a, if I had you in a podcast as an investor, we'll talk about some of those topics. Sure. Yeah. I, th I think there's probably two, there were two major influences on me that kind of kicked my career off. The first was uh, that I was involved in, in our family business, and it was akin to like a nano cap stock. It was a small company out of Cleveland, Ohio. It was a distributor of hardware products. And so I really grew up watching my father in this instance manage a business just like Chris manages a business. And, and I could really appreciate not only as an investor, but also as an operator, really the struggle and difficulty to create value in the long run. And then the second was, I just, I just kind of got introduced to value investing. And I think, you know, Buffett says it's like an inoculation, like for some people it just takes. And it, and it really just resonated with me. I really, it just made sense. 
And, you know, I spent, you know, many years, my teenage years and into my 20s, really just working to expand my knowledge base, you know, read all the kind of the classic security analysis and the intelligent investor and common stocks and uncommon profits and all those like core books that, you know, every value investor has read or should read. And I think I decided when I was getting out of college, I really just wanted to go and kind of get classically trained in value investing. And so I, I had an opportunity to work um, with uh, Bill Nigren at the Oakmark Funds in their domestic research department when I graduated from school and I worked there in their research department for a couple few years. And I kind of call it my MBA. I mean, I really learned the process of long-term you know, low kind of low risk minimization, risk minimization, return maximization investing. And it was, it just, it flowed. It made sense. Like it, it, it was a, it was, it was my MBA. It was a great education. And I work with the smartest people in the industry and I soaked up as much as I could, but I knew that I, 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 I could have a bigger impact having some of that operational influence in my life in the smaller space. And so I was always interested, I was always drawn to making an impact in a business at the, at the, at the nano and micro cap level, that sub hundred million dollar, $250 million market cap space. And, you know, I kind of ran a dual career track because around that time, maybe I was, I think I was 23 or 24, it was about 10 years ago. I was put on the board a first time by a, uh, a mutual friend, a, a, a friend and an investor in first time who, when Chris was aforementioned discussing the, the restructuring process, you know, the board changed over as well. And so that's when I had an opportunity to, to step on the board at first time and kind of practice what I, what I preach, right? And kind of take what I was learning on paper and put it into practice at the board level. And that was just, uh, just an unbelievable experience for me. You know, while I was sitting on the board, um, I was an investor in first time sitting on the board in first time. Um, I was still working in investment management. I went from the Oakmark funds in Chicago and I went over to North star investment management, which is just a really great small and micro cap set of mutual funds that also located in downtown Chicago. And so I got to run their research department uh, for a a few years and continue to apply the professionalism and the process that I saw at the at the billion dollar level, right, which was at the Oakmark funds investing into the GEs and the McDonald's and the, the, the large cap stocks and go and take it and put it into the micro and small cap level. And you know, I found a lot of success, you know, frankly, taking that professionalism and taking that, that due diligence process, which is, is rigorous and applying it into some of the smaller companies. And not only did that give me an edge in how I was doing research, but it allowed me to be more thorough in my research and earn the respect of the management teams like Chris and frankly, that was, in my opinion, how our, how our relationship blossomed because, you know, I, you know, in, in finance, I found it's, it's easy to sit on the side of the table where you've got all the money and you're the one making the investment and kind of wag your finger and say, you know, this is how you should do things. But because we hold the power, we have the money. But I never took that attitude because I knew what it felt like to be on the other side of the table. And uh, and I think it, you know, I earned trust and I think it was really how Chris and I came to, uh, develop a really strong partnership and friendship and relationship over the last 10 years, because he knew that I wasn't taking for granted the fact that he had the experience and we, you know, worked to create a symbiotic relationship over the last 10 years that really does take equal parts, you know, rational capital allocation which is a very kind of cold, impersonal term and marry it to like the, the feet on the street, you know, the guys that are creating the value and the, the, the men and women that are, you know, working every day to take a dollar and, and turn it into two and two into four and four into eight. In, in our case, we took it from a dollar to now 15 and hopefully we can take it from 15 to, you know, a, a larger number. Right. Very good. Well, me, me, me too. <laughs> so I'm right. You, you too. <laughs> but, 
but we're again, we're marrying some of the experiences that I that I just mentioned, sitting with just really, really sharp investors, institutional investors, and, and seeing their process and and marrying it into the operational level. And that's good. You're a numbers guy, so the online you kind of have a, a probably a really good input or right uh, so, the online business. And I love the capital allocation uh, experience you had in the past. And right. That's really important too when you're dealing with public companies, especially ones that are growing. You know, you want totally. to have a capital structure for a lot of small companies without without diluting. And and and, and 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 that's like, you know, it's you know, in in and I, I kind of talk about investing and in, in operating in, in this context. In investing, you're you're making a few major decisions over a long period of time. You might only make three to five investments a year, right? Now you're doing a lot of prep work for that, but you're making a few decisions over a long period of time. Operations is the exact opposite. You're making a lot of decisions. I mean, Chris, how many decisions do you think you made today? 20, <laughs> right? It right, yeah. was in eight meetings, you know, a lot of decisions, small decisions every day. And again, that's where there's a lot of value in, in, and I think why Chris brought me into in the first time to run our e-commerce business, because we're managing thousands of different page listings and products and inventory levels. There's a lot of moving parts. And one of the things I got very good at and really have, have come to love is making a lot of decisions every day, but also at the same time, taking the investment expertise of slowing processes down creating really good reporting structures and creating really good kind of thought structure so we could maximize the efficiency of, of our e-commerce business and think intelligently and rationally, just like we would do at the board level, but we're doing it now at the SKU level, the product level, the product line level, the customer level. So, and we hope to continue to do that for many years in the future. And that's going to kind of give you an advantage in your acquisition strategy too, by knowing the numbers and where they could be. And no, no question. When when we found uh, Inner Space, we liked it because it it did two things. It fit into our core competency, and then it also expanded our core competency. And as as you know, I'm sure all of the investor folks out there know. I mean, you 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 start with this core, and kind of your goal is to learn. And grow over time, so you can grow that core, core, that core, core competency. And we liked it because there was a direct overlay into our e-commerce business because they had a online home goods distributor, but then they also had this, this like similar but also not similar, you know, mattress in a box distributor into an industrial market, and you know, again, Chris did this great job because he looked at the product and he said. This is a home decor product. It's just instead of it being in your residential home for these truck drivers, the back of their cab is their home. Mm -hmm. And so he did this massive rebranding initiative. And I, you know, assisted in the restructuring process and ran the sales process with him. So we could start selling that brand and that, that comfort and that idea. And it resonated with the marketplace. So we had the benefit of, you know, of kind of reinforcing our longer term strategy at the time, which was reinvesting into e and setting up e for what we knew was going to be a longer term growth, a multi-year, multi-market cycle growth, growth play, while also acquiring some very unique skill sets in, in the non, you know, home goods distributor market. Do you see the acquisition environment right for you guys? Um, or is, uh, do you see value out there or opportunity that you I mean, listen, you talk to any, I think, investor that's tracking markets, there's, there's always some, there's always something, right. But I think in general, prices are, are relatively, uh, spicy, <laughs> are <laughs> relatively, fr relatively frothy right now. So I think we're going to really focus in 2021 on, you know, again, making our econ business, which is, got extremely high returns on invested capital right now. I mean, just off the charts. Um, that's helped by, we have a very large net operating loss that you know, Maj, so that juices those ROICs even more. And so when you've got an opportunity where you can compound money at the, at the business level at you know 
40 to 60% return on invested capital, you want to migrate capital toward that. So I think we're going to take 2021 to continue to reinvest into our core, core business model and free ourselves up to um, become a cash generator. So hopefully we can walk out of 2020, out of 2021 with excess capital on our balance sheet. So we're prepared for whatever market uh, Jerome Powell wants to throw our way next year. Right. So, so now as you're, and I was talking about your investor philosophy, investor philosophy a little bit, and you kind of touched upon it already, which is great. I mean, you obviously, if you're a pure fundamental guy, you're a pure value investor. So when you're searching for your idea, let's talk, let's go away from FTDDL for a second. When you're building your portfolios on a personal level, yeah. Actually, before you went to North Star, were you were you investing in smaller companies yet, personally? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, throughout my whole career, I was investing in, in the micro and small cap space. So in, in terms of find, when you find your ideas, are you using screens? Are you um, looking at press releases, SEC files? How do you actually get your idea funnel uh, going? I remember one of the first, it was probably one of the first questions I asked myself as like, I remember as an 18 year old, which is like, how do these really smart people find investment ideas? And Maj, again, you're you're in the game, and I, I think it. I think you would agree. It's a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of building an investor network and talking with people. I think it's a little bit of doing the hard work of like kind of the the Moody's manual where you're just starting at A and you're going through Z. I think it's a little bit of just creating those watch lists and paying attention and and putting yourself out there. You know, I think it's you got to be creative. Um, but I, I do believe it's a little bit of everything. And the longer I do this, I do think there's an advantage in time because you've just seen like you at geo investing, you've got a database. I mean, you've got a database of, of thousands of companies that you've been watching for years, which gives you an edge because things are moving so much faster today. Right. And so that I think the windows that we have to take advantage of price dislocations is, is, is narrowed. And right. so I think it's, there's a lot of value in creating a, a stable of companies to watch and you watch them like a hawk. And this goes back to my prior point around, you don't have to make a lot of decisions in a year to do well. I mean, I think, you know, I would assume a lot of your listeners, if they would have made smart investments in March, they would have earned three to five years worth of return in about six to 12 months. <laughs> right. Excellent. But they, they had to have the conviction to make that to make that investment over that two week period um, while prices were cratering. So you bring up conviction too. Though. That was actually one of my questions I want to ask you. Like, how do you, maybe while you're doing that, maybe you could talk about some of your war stories, good and bad, but how do you, how do you build your conviction? Um, do you have any, any like I, I build it through interviews. I mean, I love yeah. doing, I understand management really well. Um, maybe it's numbers for you. I mean, what is it that your conviction process well, I, I, th I think that the, the screening process, the easiest place to start is with numbers, right? I think there's a, there's a, uh, there's like a gate process, right? Like it's the hard, the hardest part is to get yourself into the business and talk to the management team because their time is scarce and da, 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 da. The easiest thing is, is numbers. So for someone like me, who is the kind of guy that thinks, uh, you know, the winner wins, wins, the winner isn't the one that finishes the first race first. He's the one that finishes the last race first. Okay. And so I'm someone who likes to be very patient and screen things out with numbers. That's, that's an easy place to start because you can learn a lot through the numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I usually stay away from businesses that I can't do that. Okay. Right. So the first time would be in a good Chris and me are kind of celebrating our 10 year anniversary of working together in February. So people can look for themselves just at our numbers. And there's a 10 year track record of, did we get it done? It's a bit interesting and, though, it's like, so when you're look when you're finding an idea, let's say you wanna find the next turnaround, the numbers might not be obvious, right? Well, I, th I think it depends what hat I'm, I'm wearing, right? So if it's a, if it's a, I'm a minority investor sitting at my desk and I'm gonna invest, you know, 2% of, of an IRA or something, I think that's a different hat than Okay. You know, me sitting allocating capital with Chris at at a at a takeover level. Sure. Right? If that's what we decided to do. So I think it depends, but I think from an investment policy standpoint, turnarounds are tricky. And I learned, I remember one of the lessons I learned from uh, the smart guys that I work with at North Star was you, you know, you might be giving up some of your forward return 
by not investing right at the bottom. But if you wait a short period of time to get the conviction that the turnaround is working or they're through the kind of the trough, the worst period, it, it doesn't really matter, you know, because you've taken risk off the table. And, and the ethos that I've always had in my career that Chris has at the business level that we share very intimately is we are trying to minimize risk while maximizing return. Okay. okay. I can go and find you flyers to maximize return, but if it's coming at a high risk or a high probability of permanent capital loss, I'm not, I'm not really helping you. Right. You know, our goal is to compare in this instance, the first time or, or any other investment I make and say, Hey, if I, if I see that return in other places in the market, Bitcoin or the large cap space or Tesla or GameStop today, <laughs> you know, am I doing it? And I, am I providing, or am I earning that return with a much lower probability of permanent capital loss? Right. And I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, Chris and I work so closely and he executed fl near flawlessly to minimize the risks inherent at the operational level at first time. Mm -hmm. Because in the long run, that's going to reflect very positively. And it's going to, out of skill, we will find luck. And that's what happened in, in 2020, right? Which is we were prepared. We had minimized the risks inherent in our business model. So we were ready to take the return when it came. And I take the same, I take the same mentality when I'm looking for investments in the passive front and the passive level. So I'd assume you're, you're mainly a, more of a concentrated investor versus diversified investor. I'm, I'm a concentrated investor, hands down. Okay, great, great. So now let's talk about, I like to talk about um, some of your, your, maybe your biggest success. Maybe it's FTDL. <laughs> or, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I was, I was, <laughs> and, and your worst, maybe you can talk about some of your learning lessons. Maybe if you have any, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a spot. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. FTDL is hands down the biggest success in my life because not only is it provided a, um, a a nice financial benefit, you know, but it's also provided education, uh, friendship, uh, opportunities to grow and learn. I obviously have you know Chris and and other people around first time to thank for that. Um, from a, from a passive level, I would say probably the one I loved the most was a company called Dover Salary. Um, Dover Salary was a retailer of equestrian products. They were a niche retailer that had cornered the market and the market was so big and they had a, such a small market share that they had just years and years and years to grow. And I liked it because, as you know, Maj, very rarely do you really find a compounder in the microcap space at the business level. But this one was a compounder and it was a success and a failure. The success because it, it did well. And the CEO, his name was Stephen Day. He was a Harvard grad. I went and I was just outside of Boston to headquarters and I went and spent a day with him. And he was just smart and he had a good he had a good business strategy and he was just executing and it wasn't sexy. It was just boring. And, you know, he was the biggest player amongst all these fragmented, you know, tech shops. And he just every year was opening like five, five new locations, five new locations. And it got to the point where the business sold, sold out. They, uh, they went private and the investment did well, but I, I was really sad to, to see it go private because it was a stock that I really wanted to see right. you know, and hold for a long time, including through a period like COVID. Cause I think they could have just cranked the competition. Oh, right. All yeah. Mom and pops were, you know, have been, I'm sure struggling and I'm sure he would have done really well. I'm going to tell you my biggest failure um, was a company you're familiar with. You'll have to remind me of the name. And I'll tell you the story. They do the, the film over the cars. It's like an 100 bagger. Oh, XPLT. XPLT is my biggest failure. And I have to tell <laughs> yeah. you why. I think everyone's had that fail. <laughs> had that, yeah, one I invested. I, I was looking to invest in that company. Chris, I don't think we've ever talked about this one. When I was really kind of doing the micro in the nano cap space and I did the A to Z and I found this oh, company. Oh, sorry. It's, it's XPEL. I'm sorry, Bob. XPEL. 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 I found this company at 30 cents. And I had a call scheduled with the CEO 
And I remember, because I at, at this company level, I, I had to talk to the CEO if I was going to make an investment into a business. And they usually had the time. And I love to talk to these guys and women. So it was great. And he, I had a call scheduled and he never called me back. And I don't know, like maybe he just, whatever. Like, you know, he's, a, I'm sure he's a busy guy and I wasn't important enough. And I didn't invest because I didn't have an opportunity to talk to management. And I think we all know where that one went. Usually my errors in the investment in the investment space are ones where I don't hold long enough. That's a huge error for me. Or I'm, I pass an opportunity because I was, I've been too conservative. Yeah. That's easy to do in our space. I mean, I mean a lot of times you can, uh, the tough part about, you know, bailing, bailing early is that there's so many instances where, you know, a decade of returns can be gone in a flash if the company really exactly. doesn't, doesn't um, perform. So that's hard. I've, I've learned to become a longer term investor myself though. Uh, it's tough because you ride out of that volatility. And it's not fun because you know, right. a lot of times you're giving up great returns and other stuff while you're waiting. And I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm very much a, again, a kind of a classically trained value investor. So I always say that I'm very good at buying things. I'm really bad at selling things. <laughs> I'm just, I just, that's my, not my strong suit. I, I, I know how to find a dollar bill for 50 cents, but I usually, uh, bail out too soon. Now with XPL, I mean, um, I actually own that too. I'm mean, around when you bought it, probably 20, 25, 30 cents. Yeah. One of our guests we had on, uh, Paul and Julia, uh, from small cap discoveries um, just uh, wrote that wrote that stock up on the Meyer cap club and um, he's, yeah. he's a great job with that we ha- I had him on a few episodes ago or maybe last episode or two episodes ago and um, but I, I sold that thing at three I don't so I don't know what's worse your situation are buying it or me actually having it <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll both take our legs I owned uh, and then and then since it's topical for today I owned game stock about nine months ago at three bucks but I think I sold it at about seven. Oh, well, geez. So we can go on and on. I have Monster Beverage. <laughs> that was the my worst one. And the, but I had, with Expel, I had the same situation you had. So I, um, I had put a call in, or when I had one of my uh, analysts put a call into the company. Yeah. And, they, and they had to say, well, we're not interested in talking to anyone. So, we, right. so I never got, the, never got the call. Right. And eventually met them at the, at the club. And, and I don't think I would do it anymore. Well, you won't, you won't be able to hold that against us. God willing, in 10 years, if we do what we, what we think we're going to do, because not only have you been able to talk with us, we came on to your, on your podcast. No excuse right now. Yeah. So right. just gotta, you just gotta be able to get there with the illiquid situation and be able to get some more stock. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both, you and I both. Yeah. Oh, right, well, this, this has been awesome guys. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, it's, I'm glad um, you did this. It's good to see both of you. I'd like to buy stocks in the smaller cap market. Um, so, um, maybe we'll have an update call in, in a few quarters to see how things are going. Um, but, uh, really, um, really thank you, man. And I wish you guys all the luck. Thank you. Yeah. I, 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 I as an operator, appreciate coming on and, uh, you know, I love, uh, I love the experience and, and again, listening to, uh, other micro cap investors and, uh, value investors. And again, Andrew and I, you know, t- t- talk about this stuff daily. And so, uh, a, a wider spread uh, exposure is great. And so uh, again, thank, thank, thanks a lot for uh, ha- having us on. Right, great, man. Oh, Bobby, you know, I think Bobby had a question. I'm sorry, Robert, you there? Yeah, just, hey guys, I just had one question before I let you go and please feel free if, if you guys are still in discussions on this, feel free to tell me to screw off and we're still talking about it. But, <laughs> but <laughs> with, with you know, there, there's, I'm sure you guys saw the new SEC rule with uh, companies that are either on the pinks or gray sheet listed stocks about uh, having to go either on the QB, QX, or I guess pretty much going private. I mean, have you guys thought about this new rule and, and how that might affect the company and, and some of your plans going forward on that? You know, we, we are, again, one of the cultural mentalities that we have is we're always looking to professionalize. I get this, we, we really get this question. I get it in investor calls pretty frequently around the volume and the liquidity and all this stuff. And we're long, we're like long game guys, you know? So in the short run, you know, who knows, we can't obviously talk about what we're kind of working on behind the scenes, but in the long run, we're looking to professionalize. We're looking to become better. We're looking to be more accessible, not less. And so it's kind of an indirect way of answering your question to say that we're always thinking about ways to improve um, our status in the public space. 
Very good. We'll leave it at that. No follow-ups. That's a good answer. <laughs> that's a nice, that's a nice skirt. I like yeah. it. We're good. Good piece. Good piece. That, that was good, Andrew. All right, guys. Well, let's close it off with uh, where everybody can go and find more information about you guys. So, uh, Chris, Andrew, where can everybody go and find more information about FTDL? Yeah, the, uh, obviously the OTC, uh, uh, ticker symbol FTDL. Uh, we've got some information uh, uh, on our website, firsttime.com, www.firsttime.com. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, again, really, really enjoyable. Thanks so much for having us and uh, uh, hope to be, be back soon. Very good. Thanks, guys. Very good. And Maj, uh, I don't know, where pe- where can people follow you? No no one knows who you are, especially <laughs> if they listen to this. Where should they find you? Geoinvestion.com is where um, you can find out more about our company and what we, the, research, the kind of research we do. Um, you can reach me at Maj at geoinvesting.com. Uh, my phone number is 267-246-3263 if you want to talk shop and talk stocks. Follow me on Twitter at Maj Geoinvesting, and you can follow Geoinvesting at Geovesting um, on Twitter. And uh, we have memberships, uh, biannual and annual. Um, and you can um, see this episode of Avoid the Crowd on geovesting.com and I think of Bobby's YouTube channel also. Nice. I didn't have to do the plug myself. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a lot of fun, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you back on here soon. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you guys. Much. Thanks, guys. See you later, man. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network and Maj Don are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy, sell, short, cover securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value if we are long and fall if we are short. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast.